This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we've got an interview with 63 kilo lifter Julia Williams, who is just days out from Powerlifting America Nationals on February 25th. Julia is a smart person with great ideas about the sport. We go through her whole backstory right up through how she's feeling going into PA Nats this weekend. But before I bring Julia in, don't forget that PA Nats will be streamed live on the SPD Apparel YouTube account. Thank you to SPD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com, become a member, check out our event page for all of our upcoming events and our store page where you can find merch like this hat and this shirt. All right, now let's get on to the interview with Julia Williams. What's up, Julia Williams? Welcome to the Powerlifting America podcast. How's it going? Thank you. Good, good. Um, you know, 10 days out and uh, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We were just talking before we went live and uh, you mentioned that you have your last SBD day coming up this Sunday. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to competing in the 63s again. I always thought this was the best weight class for me. Um, cool. So yeah, when USAPL changed to 67, um, definitely started thinking about trying to find a better weight class in a different federation. Okay. So yeah, let's get right into it. Um, so just so people have a little bit of a background, like you're a super savvy veteran, you've been competing since 2017 and you've been mm -hmm. extremely consistent. Like you're doing two meets pretty much every single year. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's one year where you did three, one of them was like in January, but, and you also have big meat experience. Um, you can be at the Arnold in 2020. And so like, you've been on a really big stage, you've been involved in the sport for like by today's standards. I mean, you're like a, a, an OG of the sport for sure. Um, and so I'm really excited to like get to know you because I haven't heard you on any of the other podcasts or anything. So you just mentioned that you know, USAPL switched their weight classes around from 63 to 67 and a half. And what was it about it that that was one of the reasons that made you want to switch and like try to come over to power of team America and go the IPF route? Um, what was it? Was it just, you don't feel comfortable getting up to 67 and a half or is hard to keep on, uh, stay at that weight class for you? Or, or what is it about that? That was challenging. Yeah. I mean, so when I first started lifting, I was actually like 95 pounds. Um, and I'm five, five, um, five, five and a half, just to give you an idea. Um, okay. I've always had a very hard time putting on weight. Um, and so I got up to 57 and, um, that was a lot for me already. Um, and then over time, I kind of grew out of that weight class as you know, I would have expected. And the 63s was right there. And I thought this was really a weight class I could grow into. And then I think like, I did maybe one or two meets at 63. And then maybe it was three. And then mm -hmm. um, the IPF and USAPL split, and I had to choose between 60 and 67, which 60 is totally doable on a 24 hour weight cut, but it's not doable on a two hour weight cut. And 67 is large for me. Like it, it took, I was eating 4,500 calories a day on wow. my low calorie days wow. just to get up to 66. Um, and that just, it wasn't sustainable health wise. Um, it, it, helped my lifts, but I haven't actually lost that much strength coming back. So I feel much more comfortable at 63. That's awesome. I can really relate to that. I have the same uh, issue where like I'm six one. So like if I were going to actually be good at powerlifting, I would need to be like a 120 or something, you know, and it's really hard for me to even make 93. Um, and so um, I can see that being a problem. Like you said, it just becomes like a um, where eating becomes like a job and it's not enjoyable, like, and you're just like stuffing, you know, like, trying to get calories. It really takes the fun out of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I do want this sport to be a, a sport where people can make a living off of it eventually, but for right now it's an amateur sport. And mm -hmm. if you're not enjoying it, you know, that that's not good. So yeah. It's still though, it's interesting. And like, in, in my case, it's not healthy, but, um, it does give me an excuse to just be eat anything. <laughs> um, it, it, obviously though, like, you know, um, 
I'm not a serious power lifter, but it's kind of like, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm constantly trying to fill out my weight class. So, um, that oh, does, yeah. it is fun. It is enjoyable for me, but I could see, you know, like if you were taking it very seriously, like you do, um, that it would become a, a big pain and it wouldn't be very fun. So, um, but yeah. yeah, it looks like you did four meets at 63 and then oh. you did two meets at 60. Um, and then, yeah, it looked like you weighed in pretty somewhat light for 67, um, and your two meets. And that's actually when, you know, you did your best total actually at 60. Um, it looks like a 455, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, your dots, your highest dots, that's when you cracked 500 dots, um, 505 dots. And so that's really cool. All right. So whenever the, you know, weight class is switched, then take us through kind of like that transition. You started looking around and I guess all the other federations in the U S are on those same weight classes. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a talk with my coach, um, Juan Sanchez, and he and my other teammates basically said, you know, like, you can't go down to 60 unless it's a 24 hour weigh in. So I was forced to go up. And at first I thought, like, that's that's great. Like, this is my weight class, you know, like finally the tall girls in the or, you know, tall, but like yeah. powerlifting tall girls. Um in the 63s, like we'll have their day. Um, but yeah, it just, it just proved a little bit harder to get up there than I thought it would. And it just, there were a lot of things that just made me question whether, you know, 67 USAPL would be the best weight class for me going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I tried it out. Um, I don't know if, you know, I, I compete in like a lot of different federations and I try yeah. them out and um, it just wasn't really my thing. I, I like that what they're doing for the sport in terms of, you know, having these big nationals um, events, but I didn't really feel like an athlete. I felt like entertainment at, at nationals. Um, and that isn't really the vibe I, I was going for. Um, so uh, I decided I give powerlifting America a try. That's cool. All right. Well, I'm happy that you did. Um, but so that's really interesting. So it was a weight class thing, but also kind of like just the different kind of philosophies of the federations on the sport of like one, maybe being more uh, entertainment and like a spectacle and kind of like an exhibition type of a thing. And then one feeling a little bit, maybe more like, like a serious sport that you would find in the Olympics. And it's yet to be seen because you've done just one local meet in Brooklyn and, um, and, but you'll see at, uh, you know, at, in Austin here in 10 days or nine days, whatever it is with a kind of different feeling of one of our national meets. Um, so getting into that, is there something in your background? Like, do, were you an athlete growing up? And so, you know, you kind of have this, you know, vision of like what an athletic competition should be like. Um, yeah, I mean, I did all the sports when I was growing up. Um, I wasn't good at all the sports, but I did them. Uh -huh. And um, I really enjoyed them. And um, I really, I think that um, a lot of these federations, they kind of grew up on social media. And so there's a really big emphasis on like, gym lifts and social media marketing and making everything you know, look super aesthetic. And I don't, I don't think that that's a bad thing necessarily, but I think when that kind of supersedes the actual athletic performance aspect, um, mm -hmm. that's really not for me. Um, I just, I don't really think that that's what sports needs to be about, especially at a hobbyist level. So, mm -hmm. so what, uh, what sports like, were you good at which ones were or which ones did you put the most time into growing up uh I did I did golf and uh track actually okay. Okay, so cool. two individual sports or did you run relays I, I did mostly uh individual I mm -hmm. I did the 400 and the 800 I did some relays but I wasn't so good at getting the baton you know there was a lot mm -hmm. of like hand-eye coordination involved and uh <laughs> yeah just wasn't just wasn't for me that was like the first day that you thought oh maybe I could just lift weights 
and that's it, you know, uh, as far as hand-eye coordination is concerned. Uh, yeah, that's... just stay in one place and like. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's good though. I think, you know, doing individual sports growing up, it gives you that kind of like discipline of like working on your craft and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could imagine, I think golf is a perfect example of a sport where it could be a spectacle with like fireworks shooting off and everything, but that would totally mess up the game. You know, it's already yeah. hard enough just having a crowd there uh, clapping. They have to constantly mm -hmm. keep the crowd quiet, you know, um, so that when you're putting or, or whatever, hitting a shot, you're not being distracted by what's going on around. And so you can only imagine if there's like screaming and fireworks and uh, lights flashing everywhere, you know, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be conducive for either sport. Neither of those sports uh, do anything like that. So. Yeah, they actually, they get mad at you if your like shadow is in the wrong place, even if it's not when someone's putting, if, um, your shadow moves even if it's not like in their line or anything they still get angry like you're supposed to yeah. stay like stick still it's um totally so. yeah 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 so exactly and i mean uh our sport requ does require a lot of concentration as well and so i could kind of see that if you're coming from that background that you wouldn't feel the vibes of like a meet like the american pro like in the uh i don't know who put on wrpf or whatever a guy is like you know the announcer is like screaming uh, curse mm -hmm. words like at the top of his <laughs> lungs the whole time uh, that's like the opposite of what you want um if you have that golf kind of background and track is probably very similar to that as well yeah yeah it's um <clears throat> sorry um yeah. yeah it's it's just it's distracting i think um and it it kind of um takes away from the actual thing like the actual weight being lifted um it just it, it kind of reminds me i have a teammate who's really into um what is it wwe exactly it, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit um exactly yeah they had one meet actually where someone was they had um for the third deadlifts i think it was the kern us open a few years ago they mm -hmm. had um like ring girls walking around with signs that had like the third deadlifts on them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I that's... saw that. I think that abs pro me in Ireland had something like that too, where they had like pole dancers or something like on the sides um, and smoke and stuff. And I mean, it's interesting. Cause like certainly that's one way to go and it's going to be like, you know, like you said good for social media. It's like kind of like quick, it's visually appealing, you know, like when you're scrolling, like you see this stuff and it like could capture your attention for a split second, but it's hard because then it's like, like you said, the athletes, the actual, you're not really falling in love with the most important part of it, which is the lifting of the weights and like the power that's being displayed. Um, and you're kind of just being drawn in for the commotion and the spectacle. So I see that I share that exact same perspective. That's why I like the IPF. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like when I watch, you know, the weightlift, like the Olympic weightlifting, um, I think like mm -hmm. that's something I want to do when I, when I watch, um, the current U.S. Open or any of these things, like I want to do it because it's a high level meet, but it's not like in itself as inspiring as something like the Olympic stage for sure. Yeah. Like I'm not into swimming at all, but when I see the Olympics, when I see swimming in the Olympics, um, I just look at, and I just think like, damn, like there's such amazing athletes, you know? Um, I remember like when Michael Phelps was like winning all these gold medals, I actually watched and it was, it, you know, you, you, you don't think, um, the, this is like some kind of circus show thing. Like you think like this is like legit. These are like top level, you know, best athletes in the world. And that's yeah. what your focus is on. It's not on what everything else is going around. So yeah, I totally, I totally see that. And I like the way that the IPF presents, um, their meets yeah. and, you know, at power in America, we're trying to do something similar as well. So, um, you know, this is only our second national, so we'll see it'll evolve slow over time, but we'll see how it goes. Hopefully you'll like it. Um, so give us a little bit of a backstory, um, as far as how you got into powerlifting. Cause again, it's like, um, I don't think too many people are that familiar with you and your story and everything. It's hard to get a glimpse of someone's like history. Also just from watching on social media as well. So tell us how you got into the sport and, uh, you know, bring us up to your, your kind of trajectory up to today. 
Okay, yeah, so um, I was, I think I was like 25 or 26, I can't remember, but I've been basically 95 pounds my whole life. Um, and again, like at my height, that's probably not even healthy. Um, it wasn't for any particular reason. I just don't put on weight very easily. And I was actually watching something on YouTube about like lifting or physique. And I was like, I want to do that. So I walked to a gym and I got, it was a 24 hour fitness. I got a personal trainer and I said, like, I want to be 110 pounds at 16% body fat or something okay. ridiculous. Like I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh -huh. um, coming straight off of a YouTube video that you yeah. were I mean, literally it, it was, it was, uh, it was that bad. So, um, That's amazing. I walked in, got this trainer. He said, I can, I can help you. Um, I did a lot of like bodybuilding stuff for about like six months and I just really didn't like it. And then he allowed me, I think it was bench. Yeah, it was bench. He allowed me to bench and I benched like I don't know. I want to say like 95 pounds or something. And I was like, Oh, I like this. So I kind of looked around, um, the area I lived in Santa Cruz at the time. And I looked around the area for, um, a strength gym and I found Santa Cruz strength. Um, and I decided that I wouldn't go there. And the first day that I went there, I showed up just to see what it was like. And there was a powerlifting meet going on. Wow. Um, and I remember I walked in and this guy had like six of the red plates on the, on the bar and he like dropped it and he like screamed. And I was like, all right, this is cool. I didn't know like this is something I could compete at. I like this way more than bodybuilding. Um, so that's how I started. Um, I got, after that, I got kind of into strongman and odd lifts. Um, and I, my first competition was actually a strongman meet. And I knew right away that that was not the sport for me. Um, okay. I what think, was it? Yeah. So we had, I remember we had to load these like 150 pound stones over like a bar. And, um, I, I, it took me like, I got like one rep and then I just, I was done because I was all like scratched up and, um, it just hurt a lot. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't that fun. And <laughs> also they don't drug test in strongman. Yeah. So I, you know, was there with my like 335 deadlift, which I thought was great. And some girl came up to me um and was like hi i'm amanda and just proceeded to rip 400 pounds off the ground without a warm-up and uh i'm like okay um you know maybe this isn't this isn't where i belong um so then i tried a little bit of this sport called arm lifting it's it's like grip strength stuff but strongman related okay um and I have really small hands. Okay. <laughs> so I, I didn't <laughs> get far. Strike. Another strike. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get far. Um, and then I kind of decided, you know, maybe I'll just focus on um, the powerlifting lifts because that's what everyone's doing. And um, I signed up for a meet. Um, it was a USAPL meet. I totaled like 682, which somehow qualified me for nationals. Wow. Nice. Yeah. And then, um, I was training for nationals and like two weeks out, I slipped a disc in my back. Ooh, damn. Yeah. And so I was out for about, I had no idea how to mitigate that at the time. So I was out for about 11 months. I think you might see the gap in there. I did some bench only mm -hmm. meets, but I wasn't really, um, I couldn't really squat or deadlift. Yeah. I see um, that. Yeah, it looks like you did two bench only meets. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh it was pretty rough. I thought like maybe I should just go back to doing like strongman because there's you can wear like a bunch of belts and you know get around things. Um but I really liked powerlifting and I stuck with it and eventually um everything healed and I 
got back to lifting and I started up again. And at that time I was, I think I did one more meet at 57, but I was really, really over the weight class and I had to um, go up and I had a coach who, uh, he was like a equipped lifter. Okay. And he, he didn't really understand the female weight classes or the two hour weigh in thing. Um, and he wanted me to stay at 57 and it just, it wasn't doable. Um, mm -hmm. And so I did the California state championships and I just didn't cut weight. Um, and then my teammate now um, found me there and she was like, Hey, why don't you join SoCal powerlifting? And then that's how I found my current couch. That's cool. So, that's a, what a journey. Uh, you, yeah. you really, so it's interesting. Like you kind of just decided at one point in your life, like that you wanted to start getting into shape and you wanted to start, you know, like gaining weight, putting on muscle. And you, you really gave it a good go with like a bunch of different sports uh, before really settling in on powerlifting. Uh, mm -hmm. So it must, you know, that's really cool to see. And it's nice to see, like, uh, I think a lot of people have a similar story where they kind of like, just want to like get in shape a little bit. They start doing one thing, bodybuilding or what, and sometimes they love bodybuilding and that becomes their whole thing. And then sometimes they find powerlifting or strongman or CrossFit or whatever. Um, so it's really cool to hear your version of that story as well. And so once you met your coach, uh, your current coach, Juan, and so just tell us his, the name of his service is uh, SoCal Powerlifting, or that's his team? Yeah, so he's a head coach at SoCal Powerlifting, um, mm -hmm. and he has most of the high-level athletes there, um, and he's actually branched out a couple of people at my local gym. Um, it's it's kind of like a an old school gym um but a couple of them saw how well i was doing under him and so now he's branching out a little bit and getting clients um from other sources too like but, remote remote clients and stuff yeah 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 and i'm remote i i always have been um i live in santa barbara so um that's about three hours away from from where he is okay. um but i go down there about um, you know, once a month or so just to, to check in and everything, but yeah, he's, he's the head coach at SoCal powerlifting. So, and you mentioned a couple of times that you met, you know, you have teammates and stuff like this. So that's really, that's also something that's a little bit different where a, a lot of lifters, you know, they, they have, they're just an individual and they don't think of themselves like, because we're coached by the same person, like we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of a cool, uh, culture that, he's created with SoCal Barbell. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's really nice to, uh, have the support because when I was lifting with the equipped guy, um, there wasn't really a team. I would go into a, this gym in Santa Barbara and I would do my workout and I'd be kind of alone. And I think, you know, powerlifting is an individual sport, but I don't think that you're going to get very far if you, are alone, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't have a support group. Um, I think it's really important to like lift with people, um, even if they're not your teammates who are just, you know, supportive and they're also driven towards becoming good power lifters specifically. Mm -hmm. um, because you do, you do, you are influenced by the people around you. So um, it's good to have good people. For sure. I mean, you hear um, people talk about this all the time, uh, you know, not just the team that's supporting you through Juan and, and, and SoCal, but also just the people you actually train with in your local gym, that they push you and they help you. I, I've experienced that 100%. Um, at my best training has always come when I have people around me that I'm training with that are pushing and keep you accountable and stuff like that and make it fun too, because then you stay consistent. Yeah, yeah. For sure. All right. And so, um, from there, uh, you picked up with Juan and it pretty much looks like looking at your numbers and stuff from around that time, you know, everything really pretty much starts taking off. And again, you say super consistent with doing two meets every year okay. and you know, the numbers are all going up and then tell us about your most recent setback. Oh, well, okay. So there's a lot of setbacks. Yeah. Um, so tell us about, you know, the whole injury situation, everything. 
Okay, so actually, I think um, when I slipped a disc back when I started lifting, I, I'd had hip problems my whole life. Um, I don't know if it was from golf or, or what, because, you know, the torque of swinging um, can really like mess up your lower body if you're not careful. Um, and so I thought that that was healed. Basically, the pain stopped. Um, but what was happening was I would squat and there's a video of me from, from the showdown from the WRPF meet I did. And, um, you can see, like, I'm squatting on one leg. Like I pretty much, when I go down, I, I like go all the way on one leg. And basically what was happening is my entire left leg was just completely locked up and like, I couldn't put weight on it. Um, and this was affecting me up the chain. Um, I also at the showdown um, on my third bench, I decided to go for 259. I don't know why it was, I knew it was a little bit too much. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the spotters on the left side took the bar when I failed the lift. The other one on the right side didn't and I felt a pretty hard pull. And so my shoulder has been pretty messed up since then. Um, I haven't really gone above like, you know, 240 in training, I think 225 in a meet. Um, Those are still like pretty huge numbers. Um, like, and, and I remember you just mentioned a minute ago, like you started off benching 95 yeah. pounds. And so, I mean, you're, I think you have like, you probably in the gym bench 250 before, right? Is that right? Yeah, I think I got like 265 touch and go, um, but 250 paused a couple of times. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm built That's for bench. Huge. That's so, huge. Those are, yeah. those are really big benches like those. Uh, what is that in kilos, like 265 um, or, or here we can see because you've in competition, you've done um, what was your best bench? It's. I think 112, I did. 112, yeah. 112 and a half. Like that's a, that's a big bench. And yeah. Yeah, I think the world record in your weight class, like 143, like you're not, you're in the neighborhood of it. And obviously that's a Corolla recently hit that. And the numbers that you're talking about in training 265, mm -hmm. that's pretty, you're right there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely like, I think if I were able to train consistently without being injured, for a year, um, I think I could get to 300. Um, but so yeah, I mean, that's one of my goals too. <laughs> it's actually, it's amazing. You know, like Jen Thompson, Corolla, um, Meg, they're, Meg. they're all benching above 300 as 63 kilo drug tested women. I mean, yeah, and that's, that's your weight class. I mean, yeah. what is it about 63s? That's wild. They are the biggest benchers by far. And I mean, um, you know, Jen has moved around in weight, different weight classes and whatnot, but she's basically benching that same amount, um, in whatever yeah. weight class she's in, <laughs> she's, she had all the world, like couple, uh, world record, uh, for bench, a couple yeah. of the weight classes until Corolla recently broke it. Um, so that's crazy. The 63s are amazing at bench. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, um, part of it is like 63 to 69 kilos, um, kind of appeals to a certain, they say weight classes aren't high classes, but I think it appeals to, you know, pretty much the average height range of women. And so the talent pool that enters those weight classes is larger in terms of population. And so I think that that might have something to do with like the top end talent really showing up there. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, really like 63 and maybe even now 57 to um to 76 is just wild you know oh, it's so so stacked these weight classes and I, I think as we the sport continues to grow like um we'll see all the weight classes fill out even more but these weight classes that you just mentioned are just like if you look at ipf worlds it's so <laughs> exciting because like you legitimately i mean other than leah who kind of stands out you know <laughs> as being uh, an outlier where she's, you know, can win two weight classes and stuff other than her. It's like every, there's a, a bunch, like you know, 20 women that are 
just all right there battling. And it's, it's super cool. I think it's the most exciting weight classes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing that I can't remember. I think the Carpino three for, for the 63s is, is above 500 kilos. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was going to be 505 or something like that. It was right around like what met, what one world. Well, yeah, I think it was because of course, because the previous years, Leah had pushed it up so high. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So Carpino is like, so, so if, let me get this straight. So Carpino yeah. three is like the average of the third place lifters. Yes. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, it, like for our, to make on, onto our national team this year, we're doing a Carpino one, which is basically the average over the last three years, um, the average first place finisher. Um, mm -hmm. so a Carpino three would be over the last three years, um, the average third place finisher. And then if in the case of ties, they usually go to like, uh, they take a four-year average and then mm -hmm. a five-year average. And this isn't something that Power in America uh, came up with. It's something that other federations have been using to select world's teams and stuff before. Um, but mm -hmm. yes. Um, so yeah. So what do you think about it? What was your thoughts um, whenever, since we're on the topic of, of the qualifying totals to make it on the U.S. national team? So at first I was, you know, shocked. And obviously, um, you know, the 63 and the 69 kilo weight class, um, there's some outliers there. And so that really pushed it, pushed it up. Um, and at first I thought, you know, like who is going to make this? Like Meg's total at that time was like five, 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 five. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, you know, I mean, if I hit all my gym numbers and somehow get healthy, like I think my total would be 508. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, it wasn't close. Um, so when Meg showed up and hit the total, she did at the meet that we were at, um, I was like, you know what, actually these numbers, these numbers might be right because you don't, it's worlds, right. You know, like you don't want to be sending everybody to worlds or it kind of loses um, the prestige it has, I think. Um, so I think they're good. Um, cool. Yeah. It was a, I can tell you, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of back and forths on, uh, the people who made the decisions, uh, for this selection on this team. Um, so many things were taken into account, obviously with Sheffield being involved and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so just so people know for, for Julia's weight class, it's, the, in the 63 kilo weight class, the total to make it onto the national team is 518.5 kilograms, which is a huge number. As she mentioned this last year at worlds, Meg Scanlon, who won worlds, um, and was the representative from the USA total 505 at worlds. So this is 518.5. And that's because it's taken into account that 505 number, but also the two previous years when Leah um, had big, big numbers at worlds, which is probably, I think they're probably like in the 550, 540s range, something like that at worlds. Um, so that, that's why that weight class, the Carpino is extremely high. For instance, if you go up a weight class to 69, the, the Carpino one qualifying total is only 522 and a half. So, you know, a whole weight class up and it's only, you know, four kilos, uh, higher mm -hmm. for a qualifying total, which that's, if you look through the numbers, like that's, that's definitely an outlier weight class, the 63s. Um, so, but then, yes, like you mentioned, Meg totaled at her local meet 537 and a half. So way above the 518 required. And so it's looking like it's, it's been interesting because you're right. Like, I think like Was we had Wasker on the podcast and he mentioned this as well. Like when the King of the Lifts initially saw the numbers, they were like, oh my God, these numbers are really high. And who knows if there's people that can actually hit them. But then people have kind of come out of the woodwork to come in that, can hit them. And so it's been kind of an interesting little experiment because I think kind of some of the thought behind it was that there would be some open weight classes and we would take uh, alternates who didn't hit those qualifying totals based just on their ranking on Carpino scores. Um, but now it's really looking like almost, almost every weight class people are going to hit those numbers. Yeah. I think one thing too, is that people kind of maybe underestimate is the power of saying you know this is like an olympic weightlifting they have the world standard um if you say this is you know what you have to hit 
people who are driven um, will come out and hit that number. Um, if you don't say that, I think a lot of times people will aim lower just because they might not know it's possible. And so I think it actually progresses a sport quite a bit when you, when you put out these high qualifying totals. Yeah. Uh, when you set the bar high, it's like people rise to the challenge. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So you mentioned about your injuries. Um, so getting back to that, how is the left leg now? Is it good? <sighs> it's all right. It's all um, right. I actually like I've, I've done a lot of work on it. I, I went in like probably three days ago and I tried to do a top single and I got up to 352 and I like got halfway down and then I just stood up and racked it. Um, mm. And then I tried it again and I, I, I hit depth and everything, um, which if you know, if you follow me, I have trouble with, um, but I, it hurt a lot. Um, so I rolled out a bunch and then I went in a few days ago and I squatted 391. So it's getting there, but it's, um, that's good. That's awesome. It's, it's a work in progress for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think if you can get healthy, like these are, these are big numbers that we're talking about. So you're a legitimate threat in the 63s. Um, and then how about the arm, the shoulder for bench and stuff? Um, so going into nationals in like nine, 10 days, what are you expecting? What do you think you're going to be able to hit? Oh man, I really, I have no idea about that one. So okay. I think, um, I don't know. I'd like to hit 242. We'll see what I can open with. I'm also really nervous about that bench roll. Okay. Are you um, affected by that? I wouldn't say I'm affected in the same way someone like, um, you know, Mike Scanlon is, um, mm -hmm. but I, my, I'm on the line for sure. I'm on the line and. Oh, one sec. You just muted. You, you just went on mute. Sorry. You were talking about the bench depth and you said, last thing I heard was that you're, you're on the line. Yeah. Um, so I played around with it and I can like flare my elbows and for sure hit depth, but I can't really do that with my shoulder. So I have some concerns. I think um, we'll see for sure what, uh, what the rules are at this meet. And then um, we can go from there. Um, I think I'll be in a very good spot for, you know, Pan Ams or something like that, but. That's awesome. Oh my God. I love to hear you mentioned Pan Ams. Um, we're talking in the North American powerlifting championships, uh, the NAPF. Um, and, uh, a lot of people don't know about it. And so I love to hear that you're mentioning that you're going to be like ready to go. You're already planning for that. That's super awesome. Um, it's going to be amazing this year. It's in the Cayman islands. So, you know, really can't beat it. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a fantastic. I'll be excited to go to that one. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the concerns, like with the bench rule, um, I've seen like Meg, we talk about a lot. Um, her coach made a, a nice post where she kind of had a case study of like three athletes, um, all women and what they had to do to hit depth. And there's definitely some things where they, she, she mentioned all three of them had some shoulder issues as a result of this, you know, so I don't know where this bench rule is going to go. Um, certainly we want to get more athletes like yourself, get feedback, you know, um, especially cause you're a coach as well and see like, like how this goes and see what we can do because it's one thing to like, try to make the sport more viewable and watchable and like maybe more like, I don't know, legitimate in the eyes of like the Olympics or something like that, who, who care about those kind of ratings and stuff. But if athletes are getting injured as a result of this or injuries reflaring up because of this, then we have to th think about that. Cause we're obviously for the lifter first, you know? Yeah, I think um, what I saw, the, what gave me that idea is I saw, um, I think it was a German girl posted a video about how you can narrow your grip, but if you tuck your elbows, you still won't hit depth. But if you do a wide grip and you flare, it'll actually appear like you hit depth. Um, so 
that was really interesting to me. Um, I think, you know, it's probably a step in the right direction, but I think um, we might need to think it through um, as far as how it's implemented to, to make it, you know, one, so that there's not a bunch of frivolous challenges at Worlds, um, and two, uh, so people know what to train for. Exactly, because yeah. athletes need to know like what they're doing, obviously. Um, that's huge. And yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing about these kind of rules. Like you're throwing something out there and you don't know exactly how it's going to, because athletes are going to adapt and you're going to find a way. And so I think it, referring back to that po post that uh, Kelly Mann had made was basically they experienced some shoulder pain as they transition. And then we'll see like, because once you start doing this new flared position for a while, you're going to develop the right muscles. Your, your shoulders are going to get used to it. And maybe there won't be any like long-term shoulder effects from that. So we'll just have to wait and see over time. Yeah. Yeah. But we got to keep listening, you know, to athletes like yourself who are talking about this. So, okay. So, um, I told you this would be a short interview. Obviously it never goes, uh, it's never short. It's always long, but, um, I want to get through a couple additional things from okay. you. So we basically got your prediction and I guess finally on that, how is your deadlift going then? Oh, well, deadlift's always a struggle. I'm, you know, my wingspan's 5'1". Um, okay. I have a long torso, a pull conventional. Um, mm -hmm. It's going, I think, you know, like mid fours is what we're hoping for. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, your, your numbers, like when you just look on open power and you just look across, like you have a good balance, like best squad is 175, 112 and a half bench. That's, that's big. And then 197 and a half uh, deadlift, like good balance across the three, really. I mean, your bench definitely stands out. So that's cool. That's that's like your weapon. Um, and usually good benchers are not great at deadlifting. Um, so <laughs> it holds true in this case. So yeah, I think it's like the squad is going to be the thing for you mm -hmm. to kind of like really get going and uh, push that total up. So, all right. So if you had to make a prediction in kilos, roughly, okay. are you going to hit around 500, you think? That would be, um, I think that would be the top end. Um, I'm aiming, I would say, you know, 490 is 490. Okay. 490. Um, if, if everything goes to plan, um, I think that that's definitely doable. And that, so, so for people who haven't looked at the roster and looked in and everything that would secure second place pretty, pretty handily, unless the young Camila Ayala comes up with some huge numbers, which I know she's, she's like a, a junior lifter. So they make fast progress. So we'll see um, what she's capable of. Um, but you know, her best total to date is a 402. So you, if you hit 490, you know, you got 90 kilos, it's probably going to be hard for her to make it up. So that'll be exciting. And then as the qualifying uh, national team criteria goes, you will most more than likely be selected for the North American powerlifting championship team. Uh, to represent the United States and uh, go to the Cayman Islands and you'll have the USA SBD singlet, you know, which everyone wants and is super cool. And so I'm, I'm excited. That's going to be super fun. So, so if you do, if everything works out right, let's just get a commitment right now. You're going to go to the Cayman Islands with us. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. You're in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, I mean, so. as long as I don't get, you know, I, I've worked really hard to get these injuries under control and yeah. hopefully everything just keeps going to plan and we can, you know, show what I'm really capable of there. Yeah. So. And then be ready again for nationals next year. I mean, this is a long patient game here. So definitely you got to get the injuries squared away before, um, you know, you can, mm -hmm. you know, really start pushing hard again and see what your full potential is. But um, all right. Well, the last couple of things I have for you is, uh, I wanted to ask, um, we're going to bring you back and do a preview show, uh, for power of the American nationals and we'll go weight class by weight class. Um, so I'll skip over asking you about your predictions from the other weight classes, but just real quick, are there other weight classes that you're looking forward to watching, uh, at power of the American nationals? Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to the 47s and the 69 kilo weight class. I think those are going to be really good battles. Um, I think, especially the the 47s. I think that you know Heather and um, is it Jessica? Jessica, yeah. yeah. Um, they're 
they're neck and neck. Um, that's going to be a great way to start off nationals. I think it's going to really, it's really exciting. It's going to bring yeah. a lot of excitement to powerlifting. And um, I think the 69 kilo weight class with um, Claire's Claire, eye. Claire's yeah. eye. Yeah, I think. Chelsea um, Savitt. Yeah, so I, I actually think I've been watching um, Chelsea Savitt's training a little bit, and I think that she's, you know, she's going to be close. She's mm -hmm. going to be close. So I think that that's going to be a good battle too, and that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, there's a wild card in there too with uh, Kelsey McCarthy, um, uh, uh, open champion, world champion. Um, I, or is she a world champion or she might've finished in second. I can't remember exactly, but she's a star in the equipped side of powerlifting a multi-time national champion. So who knows what she yeah. can do as well. Uh, it's so I think that 69, I think you're right. That's going to be a fun one because if anyone slips up or overshoots or something like that, we don't, Kelsey could be like right there. Um, yeah. so we'll have to get big Mike Z our executive director to come in and talk about Kelsey. Cause I know he handled her, um, at, at uh, open worlds this last year and stuff. So he knows her training and stuff pretty well. So he can tell us and, and also having that experience on the equip side, he kind of knows how it could translate over to raw. So I'll ask him before we do our preview show. Um, but all right. And then the other question I wanted to ask you about is um, what do you think about everything that's going on with Sheffield? Okay. So <laughs> I, <laughs> your eyes just lit up. You're like, Oh, yeah. Sheffield. I'm really excited for Sheffield. Um, I think there's a lot going on. I think um, it is very close to national. So I think that that was something that, you know, people had to kind of work around a little bit. Um, I think a lot of them are doing nationals, um, which, you know, kudos to them. Like, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Because um, yeah. they're like a month apart. Back, yeah, two meets back to back like that is, um, that's wild. But I mean, nothing really like this has happened on the tested side. Um, and, you know, I've done, like I, I did an untested professional meet um, and that's what I want for the tested side. I, I think that um, we should have that because we have very high quality lifters here. I, I would say, you know, drug tested powerlifting at the highest level is probably the most impressive lifting there is in a lot of ways and i think it deserves to be showcased and rewarded just like the um untested side so i'm really looking forward to that i think the level of lifters that are doing it we've never had this kind of talent pool um it's going to be phenomenal so yeah i agree it's going to be so exciting we've got a bunch of lifters from power in america that are in it um team usa representing hard um, and of course, you know, we've never seen anything like it. So it's going to be exciting. I do think, um, you know, SBD is doing the live stream for power of the American nationals. And so we might get to see like a little bit of a preview of what the production is going to look like. Um, they'll probably be testing out some of the, maybe some of the things that they're going to use at Sheffield or, um, and whatnot, you know, kind of work out some of the kinks. It's kind of like a little bit of a practice run for the SBD media team so i think it'll it'll be really cool to watch power in american nationals and then get to turn around a month later and have this amazing you know once in a lifetime meet that we've all dreamed about yeah i think sbd is always really um everything they do is high quality and professional so i think it's yeah. going to be great yeah. yeah for sure okay so last thing i want to ask you about is you're a coach as well <laughs> Um, and I know that you have an app that I think you just recently launched. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about, um, you know, how you became a coach and then about, you know, your coaching service, um, with this app that you just came out with. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I do mostly, um, general strength training. Um, I don't really do powerlifting coaching. I think there's a lot of people who are, you know, really great at powerlifting coaching, but, um, I'm really focused on trying to get people into the sport as opposed to um, get people to the highest level. Um, and so that's kind of what my app does um, too. It's it's an app where a lifter can sign up um, for about, it's $10 a month, I think. Mm -hmm. And then we 
have coaches that we vet. Anyone can apply to be a coach okay. and we vet them. And if they pass our test, um, they're allowed to then correct the form of these lifters. So okay. lifters can submit a video um, and then they'll get feedback from coaches that we know are top quality. Um, and what this does is it gives these lifters who might not you know, have the funds or want to put that much money into, you know, having a full-time coach because it is expensive. Mm -hmm, um, it gives them professional feedback, you know, mm -hmm. on their, on their lifts, which is not really what any of these other apps are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it also exposes them to different kinds of coaching because up to three different coaches can comment on their video. Mm -hmm. um, so they can really get to know a coach. And then if they want to work with them, they'll have a better idea of what they're signing up for. Um, and okay. yeah, I mean, it, it also allows the coach to build a reputation um, on the app and kind of have somewhat of a resume. We have them list, you know, their coaching service, their open powerlifting, all that kind of stuff. So that is really cool. So uh, this is a lot different than any other app that I've heard of. And so it kind of helps the athlete get uh, different perspectives and, and feedback on their lifts so that they can stay in the sport. They don't get injured. They stay safe, stuff like that. And then also gives coaches an opportunity to kind of showcase their services and build themselves up and gain credibility and stuff like that as well. Mm -hmm. so that's cool. And so that's a really great idea. Is this, is this all you? Did you come up with this? So I came up with this idea, um, but I have a lot of people helping me out with it. Um, you know, some of my old training partners, um, you know, they're better with the social media kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it evolved a little bit as uh, time went on. Um, there's a lot of coaching services that offer form check within um, their mm -hmm. coaching service, but you have to have already paid for that and kind of signed on. And a lot of times um, you, you might not be a perfect fit with that coaching philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to offer something to people so that they could really find a good coach. Cause I went through it, you know, like I had mm -hmm. coaches that it didn't, it didn't mesh and I got injured, you know, I stayed in low weight classes too long. So I want to yeah. make sure that people have you know, access to what they need to progress. That's a really cool concept. And, uh, sounds like, you know, something that's going to help a lot of people, um, stay healthy and get into the sport, like you mentioned. So yeah. and like a good access point for people who want to take it to the next level, be a little more serious about it. And then they'll get exposure yeah. to these, these like, you know, great professional coaches and hopefully we'll find, you know, the next great lifters this way. Yeah. Yeah. I think growing the talent pool at you know, the bottom getting people in the sport is the best way to see, you know, growth at the top for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the name of the app and how can people find it? Um, it's called uncoached and we have an Instagram, um, uncoached.app and there's in the bio, there's the website. It's only downloadable on Apple right now. Um, okay. but we will be rolling it out on um, Android uh, pretty soon. So, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll point people that way. And do you want to give out what is your Instagram handle? Um, so my Instagram handle is sleeper sbd. Um, and Tell us yeah, about that because it's a very interesting handle. Because I can never find you when I want to find you. Because your name is nowhere on your uh, account, so I don't know if you're trying to like be anonymous. That's you're in witness protection or something, but uh, or you just don't want you know weird people approaching you. But um, what's the back? What's the story behind your Instagram handle? Okay, so um, my Instagram handle for the longest time was Julia Kind of Lifts, and okay, basically, I might have been following you back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, um, basically, I was told, like, you know, once you get a 500 dots, you should probably change it because you don't kind of lift at that point. Um, and I didn't really know what to change it to. And then, you know, there's all these videos about, like, having the sleeper build and all that. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people were surprised about how much I can lift, 
looking the way I do, like I'm, I'm pretty skinny, you know, mm-hmm. um, I don't really look like a power lifter. So I thought, you know, I have a sleeper SBD. Um, okay. Okay, cool. I get that now. That makes sense. And yeah, I mean, you don't kind of lift, you've done 14 meets. <laughs> so, and you've done some big ones and stuff. So, so that's good that you changed that. Uh, well, mm-hmm. that's really cool. It's been really great to get in, getting to know you and, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, collaborating on, on some more of these podcasts and things with you. And so, um, if you, is there anything else, is there anyone else that, that you want to shout out like Juan? Yeah, I just want to shout out, um, my coach Juan Sanchez. Um, I think he's the most underrated coach in powerlifting. Um, I probably would have quit years ago if I didn't find him. And also lawyer lifter, uh, Melissa Fulgencio for bringing me on to SoCal powerlifting. Um, thank you. <laughs> you saved yeah. my powerlifting career. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you to both of them for keeping Julia in the sport. Um, and do you have any sponsors that you want to mention anything? Uh, no, I'm pretty low key. I, I mean, I don't post that often. Um, Mm -hmm. I am working with fight or quit a little bit. Um, so we'll see how that is. Um, but yeah, cool. just me. (laughs) All right, Julia. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the power of teen America podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Peace out. Bye.